get put your hands together for our moderator, Josh Donlin. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Building and Developing and Deploying with Docker panel. Uh, I'll be your host today. I'm Josh Donlin, the Program Manager for Mobile Development, Bachelor of Science. Uh, with me on stage from furthest to nearest, I have Tony Franklin from Microsoft. Uh, Lance Hudson from Hightail. And with 30 years of experience, but now with full sale, Mike Shaughnessy. A full six months at full sale so far. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> getting there. Get there. <laughs> we, we, we steal them from the industry. That's what we have to do here. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Docker. And uh, as some of you guys might know, Docker is a uh, container system for deploying applications, uh, you know, all sorts of applications, but primarily applications that live somewhere in a, in a cloud or a web or internal infrastructure. So uh, we're going to start just by kind of talking about containerization. Um, a lot of people confuse containerization with virtualization. So anybody want to chime in on kind of what are some of those key differences between those two technologies? I can give a few minutes on that. Uh, basic difference with uh, virtualization is you're virtualizing entire machines, whereas Docker, you're just in virtualizing the pieces of it that you really need. Uh, I look at Docker as more like a, like a Minecraft for, uh, for application architects. It's like you can break everything up into little blocks and then piece, pick the pieces you want, put the pieces you need, and then customize them as you want it. So it's more, it's, it's a wave of the future in my, in my opinion. So you're going to be using lots and lots of this stuff. Uh, Amazon's already doing it. You look on their GitHubs, there's thousands of updates almost every day. Major companies are committing resources to updating it. So it's, uh, it's going to be an up and coming technology that we should, we should all learn about. Uh, so speaking of major companies jumping onto it, uh, Microsoft currently uh, is one of the major players kind of entering in this Docker foray alongside of IBM, uh, Amazon AWS. Uh, why is Microsoft getting in the Docker game? Well, I think, uh, you know, with new leadership comes a new direction. And so uh, Satya Nadella has done a really good job of uh, repositioning us and focusing, focusing us on a couple of areas. One of those is building an intelligent cloud. So obviously, we didn't build the cloud. Uh, so we look to uh, partners, uh, individuals like yourselves, and technologies to, to help build that cloud. And I think, you know, these two technologies don't have to be mutually exclusive. I think they're extremely com compatible as well as, you know, complementary. And so whether it's, you know, looking at our platform as a whole and then building upon that or working together as we, as we recently announced this partnership, I think it's a, it's a good thing for all. Sure. And uh, so it seems to be this trend of kind of, you know, wave of the future. It's kind of we're on the cusp of this technology coming out. It's, it's, it's more or less new, you know, as far as technology goes. So, uh, Lance, we were talking a little bit earlier before the panel, and, and you were mentioning Hightail is, is migrating towards Docker. You want to give a little bit of background about why that decision was made? Sure. Uh, so, we have 19 plus services that we run, and our devs are, are trying to dev on the train to work, whatever, and they can't run everything on their machine. It, the way it's set up, it's set to like need seven gigs of memory and everything else. You don't have a laptop that big. So we're moving everything into Docker so that they can run just the parts they need. They can pick the versions that are in production, local, whatever they need, and run that all on their machine and, and continue to work. So there's, there's clearly some benefits to migrating towards Docker and having, uh, I think, you know, we've, we've heard it a couple times now where you don't have this, this full stack kind of problem in having it running on the laptop. So what kind of, what kind of overhead versus return, what are, what are some of the kind of the holdbacks from people fully switching over into a Docker container in general type system? Well, okay, I'll go. One of the things that we run across is that the, the networking on Docker and some of the ways you plug things in and, and external storage is a little bit, still a little bit iffy. Also, some of the ways that you actually deploy it out there is a little bit not quite smooth yet. So, uh, Docker is based on a lot of old technologies, and they're they're doing a lot of work. They they just rewrote their lib container module, so it's bringing things into a much more cohesive whole. But it's not quite there yet. So it's we're we're working on it. I'm not sure I would put it out to to uh, production environments as 100 percent yet. I don't know if I'd bet the farm on it yet. But it's certainly good for development environments. Certainly good for keeping things consistent between. You know, various arms of development and, and testing and things. So. Sure, Lance. Sir, um, let's see. I like to use Docker primarily because 
I, I want my machine to have as little, absolutely little as possible on it. And when I load an app on it, all the things that come with it, I want it to go away as soon as I don't have that app. Um, so I do use Docker in production. Um, it's great for any of your CPU tasks or services or something like that. The storage, like Mike said, it, it it's very difficult to, a lot of the orchestration tools let you move containers all around and everything else. And so having that persistent storage follow it and, and the networking behind all of that gets quite complicated. And that's, like you said, that's what a lot of the tools are currently working on. So, you know, we, we, we hear this word production, right? So the, the, the end goal of any app is to, to be out there in public. Uh, so one of the things I was noticing is that uh, Microsoft is focusing pretty heavily on on their end of that deal because uh, the, you know there's a trend of Linux and there's always this Linux versus Microsoft thing. It seems like you guys are getting away from that in terms of production world and trying to support uh, you know kind of deployed applications that can that can live on on both platforms. Uh, you want to talk us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, you know I was going to wear my Penguin T-shirt, but I actually <laughs> forgot it. Uh, we are coming together, guys, and and I think now is is the best time to kind of talk about these things. Is that no longer are we in these bubbles or silos, if you will. Um, you talk about networking challenges, you talk about storage challenges, you talk about all these challenges that come along with virtualization and or containerization. And uh, you know, we have the scale and, and technology to assist in that. You know, I, I can proudly say personally, I'm not using Docker, sorry, <laughs> but uh, the technologies that can support the development, the testing, you know, the virtualization, all of those things, uh, we're in to win together. Uh, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the security, we've got the policies, procedures, et cetera. It goes on and on about how we can support this community as a whole, not just from a Microsoft perspective, but from a partnership, Linux, take your pick of partner, Docker, et cetera. So what kind of advantages does Docker give, uh, you know, for everybody here, what, what kind of advantages does Docker give in terms of facilitating that where you can kind of maybe pick the best of whatever environment or world that you want to to work in, or, or maybe that's right for that specific service or task, uh, versus you know being kind of siloed into into one ecosystem. That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what Docker will do for you is that it's like a subsystem of a, of a micro, of an operating system. So you you take pieces of it, and you can make it all self-contained. So if you have need a different version of a certain library, you can have that in just your Docker container and carry that around with you. Uh, how that makes it easier, it means it's, it's all wrapped up in one piece. You don't have to go on and install 43 things. You bring a new developer on, you can just say, put this Docker container on there, your code lives in there, work on that, rather than install this, install that, install this. And then when it gets to production, you'll get the, your, your developer say, it works on my box, doesn't work in production, how come that happened? You know? Well, that won't happen with Docker, because you're using the same stuff. You're using the exact same code, the exact same underlying things. Makes it a lot easier. Makes it a lot You're just moving self-contained entities around rather than hundreds of little pieces of stuff. So it's, much better, much cleaner. Sure. And and we have support for you know uh, VMs like that. So MS Open Tech is a place where folks can grab these images that are pre-configured for the most part with Linux or again ready to be used with Docker. Uh, Azure Marketplace also has plugins where they can grab Docker directly from those places, publicly available. Um, so so yes, I mean just looking forward to that kind of support in in conjunction with the uh, many technical challenges that may come along with it. At least previously, uh, we can look forward to uh, making it a little bit easier uh, to do those things. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I think you, you touched upon kind of an interesting concept there, where these technologies, the fledgling technologies, you know, Docker is relatively new. So to see it gaining support from companies like Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, uh, as well as major Linux distributions, you know, so you see you see uh, the, the hub uh, aspect of Docker, where there are these pre-built containers that help you deploy quicker. Um, so do you? I mean, while it's still new, and we're not necessarily everybody on board. You know, I think you said. Uh, but all the chickens, I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, we're not there yet. I mean, the, the momentum certainly seems there in Docker's favor right now. Would you, would you guys agree? I agree. Yeah. yeah. And, and Lance, I know you, know you said that you kind of have used Docker in production, but, but you also have other, within Hytale, you have multiple applications, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, that are going on. So are there, are there aspects of Hytale that maybe are migrating that way now that you're starting to become more comfortable with the technology and seeing more of the advantages? So we, we're actually moving everything over to it slowly. It's, we want all of our servers to be identical, right? Our, our 1.0 stack has like 117 different services. And so configuring all that and managing it is an absolute nightmare. 
Um, so the new stack where all of our servers are exactly the same, in fact, they're all running the entire stack. It's our current test implementation. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter where an application is or services, they can find, each app can find it, each app can, you know, service requests, whatever needs to happen. And it just, for us, for deployment, has become a lot more, a lot simpler and the configuration has become a lot simpler. So Lance, when you, when you uh, build these things, do you usually put like one service per Docker container? Or is it I, I am of the camp of one process per container. All right. Yeah, <laughs> trying to do an entire application inside of a Docker container. Yeah, I, I prefer that because I, I also s prefer like a micro architecture thing. I know it's been a long dream of, of service oriented architecture to do right. microservices and I'm also behind that, and I think Docker really makes it possible to do that. So, you know, the, the one app, the one process per container, and it allows you to make really tiny containers with just their configuration, and, you know, you have all these pieces, and you just, they're puzzle pieces you put them together, and, and there's your application. The Minecraft of application Absolutely. architecture. Right? <laughs> we have Minecraft. We, see, we should have titled this panel Minecraft. There would have been thousands of people. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be showing Minecraft later. <laughs> uh, so, so you mentioned microservices, and, and, and much like virtualization, Docker and microservices often get confused or maybe intertwined a little bit. And, and uh, what a little, maybe, maybe we should talk about the differences between uh, microservices and how Docker maybe facilitates them versus is them. Um, I'll start. So microservice, uh, you know, or a normal service, we'll say, it's, we have an API service. It does every single thing for our front end web application. Uh, at a certain point, our application we found that that API layer was doing like 70% of this one task and everything else was getting starved of resources. So we broke it out, right? Um, that's kind of where you're going with microservices. You take each little thing and you can scale it independently. You can configure it, wh whatever you need. If it needs tons of storage or tons of memory, you can make that one service have that. And then you can use uh, load balancers or um, reverse proxies, whatever method, to kind of mesh that all together and prevent, uh, present a, an API to your, your front end. So I don't know where I was going. But I guess behind <laughs> it. <laughs> well, how does Docker enable you to facilitate yeah. that? Okay, so Docker is, like we were talking to the small containers, I can put each microservice in one of those containers and scale it independently, set different memory, CPU limits, whatever, that particular service needs. And, and then and that way you're isolating kind of the need and allowing those maybe other services to get the resources that they need as well separately? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so Tony, uh, with, with Microsoft's kind of as your focus and uh, you know cloud-based hosting and that kind of thing, um, it seems like there's some kind of overlap and, and correlation there. So it seems like a, a logical move then to, to also facilitate either your further optimization in this way in the cloud uh, to allow Microsoft-based companies to take advantage of that? Absolutely. I think when you look at things like Azure um, and the ability for it to, to scale in size and whether it is storage, whether it's processing power, whether you're setting up VMs or servers or what have you, uh, you know, the, the term scale comes up again and again, and it sounds like just this word that we use all the time, but understanding what that truly means when you go to create these things and or you have businesses that are expecting you to create these things in real time as fast as possible. And so the pace of it all, um, relying on in-house services or on-premise stuff is the thing of the past, quite frankly. And so when you look at services like Azure, easily accessible on every platform, you know, these conversations are really exciting because we find out ways to optimize what you're doing based off of the things that we're creating again together. Sure. And uh, so scalability, that's, that's the buzzword here, right? We, we're going to hear that time and time again. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at Docker, you're looking at scalability as being one of the kind of the, the ideal advantages of it. Uh, from, a, from a developer side, you know, what, is, what does that mean? What does Docker enable to you, you to do as a developer uh, to, to make apps that are easily scalable and, and you know they're going to be supported on the back end? I'll start. So 
like I was saying, running the entire stack on, on one host, um, I'm able to do that and have one or two instances of everything so that it simulates how it is in production. But in real life, in production, there's 30, 40 instances of it. And it's the exact same containers, the exact same configs, everything. And I, I just literally go, I want, I want 40 of these, not two. Nothing we've noticed on Docker is it's a lot more lightweight. I mean, we were running some tests in one of the class we were um, conducting and uh, just running a simple script that adds numbers. And just how long it took to add numbers on a VM was, was much, much longer than it takes to add numbers inside of a Docker container. It's, uh, so you don't have all the overhead, all the extra emulation of, of the uh, I.O. or emulation of memory management. So it works so much better. It's much faster, much less resource intensive running workloads under Docker containers and under whole VMs. So I guess the flip side of that is the DevOps side, right? So you have, you have this kind of ecosystem of developers and DevOps and, and trying to implement applications and, and then deploy them. So, you know, historically there's been kind of this, this you know, batting of the heads with, with devs and DevOps, and, but I want to do that, but you can't do that. So how does Docker kind of help ease that relationship uh, between the two? Well, I, I do DevOps. Um, I look at it as this way. Uh, we have moved probably 90% of configuring everything over to the responsibility of the devs because they're the ones that are experts at their application. Um, Docker lets me, when they run it on their machine, when they run it with their configuration, they're as close as they're ever going to get to how it is in production. Then we move it over to our stage or CI environments, and it's the same thing and it gets closer and closer to production, but it's that same configuration, the same uh, binaries, everything's the same. So it, it allows the devs to take more responsibility and more control over how that application works. How do you, how do you get any QA done in there? Do you do any QA at all on it? Or I mean, what keeps them from just throwing whatever yeah. out there? We, we do have uh, code reviews, we do pull requests, um, there is a QA every, like as it moves through our, our environments, um, once it hits stage, it cannot go any further without an infosec sign off, a all QA right. sign off. So there's somebody putting their, yes. their two cents in it, not good. Uh, how does that, how does that kind of, what's, let's just hypothetical, let's say on the DevOps side you're, you're deployed and uh, you know you got an internal corporate application, you're running uh, a Microsoft server base with uh, you know Active Directory, something along those lines, and you're building an app that integrates. Mm -hmm. So what is that, what does Docker help a developer maybe say that doesn't want to dev in Visual Studio or maybe they, they're, they're in uh, OSX as a developer? Uh, does Docker help facilitate kind of that exchange? Uh, with, with the stack deployment? So in, in that case, I, I would probably have, uh, yeah, have your mock services is, is a common practice. So we'll, we'll create a, a container uh, that pretends to be Active Directory, runs LDAP, whatever that actual requirement is. And so on, on the dev box, they can have that with a pre-configuration, you know, certain users, whatever the case is, and connect to that instead of the actual production system. So, so Docker uh, enables kind of a simulation of that Windows yeah, it, environment? Well, yes. It allows me to stand that up and I, it's, I just pull an image and run it with whatever config I was told to. It's not, I don't have to install anything. I don't really have to configure it myself. Um, I don't have to manage dependencies or clashing dependencies. Cool. Don't worry about patches. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so we kind of have this kind of software development life cycle. We keep touching upon kind of all these different elements of that life cycle. How, how, does, how does Docker fit into that life cycle? I mean, we, we have also mentioned things like continuous integration and, and, and those kind of topics. Uh, we'll, you know, take us through a day in the life of a, a Docker dev, so to speak. Um, when I write an application, you know, I, I'm running it locally then the Docker dream is you, you're running it inside Docker instead of locally. That way it's a clean environment. You, you, I'm running it on my Mac, the servers are Linux. If I run it in Docker, it's now on Linux, that kind of thing. So as it progresses through the life cycle and through all the different environments, it's that same binary image that you generated or at the very least that same configuration that leads to that binary image. 
Um, so like I was saying, dev, they build it, they push their code up to GitHub or wherever it's going. Um, we have webhooks into Travis. Uh, it downloads it, does all the tests, pass fail. If it passes, the image gets generated and pushed up to its repository, Docker Hub. Um, from there, we, we, we actually use a chat bot <laughs> to do all of our deployment. So it's just literally like, hey, I want chatbot put uh, this image, this version on our beta environment. And off it goes. And it's that, that same image that was generated at the beginning then is used on beta, it's used on stage, it's used for all the different testing and eventually out to production. Yeah, good. I just had something different. Does, uh, <laughs> is Azura do anything with, with uh, containers or Docker containers standalone? I, so yeah. I can actually push a Docker container up to Azura and run it? And that's one of the, the latest announcements. So oh, that's right. been great. Yeah, and I'm and learning also. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was, this was just announced like within the last. Yeah, within last year? I thought yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Been, it's been pretty recent. Like, I, I didn't think it was even live until like Tech Preview 3 of the latest. That's, like, that's right. And, you know, historically, we're not exactly quick uh -huh. <laughs> to top of these things. So it's actually exciting to announce that quickly uh -huh. we're getting behind. Uh, these technologies, and, and not just not just kind of in the foray. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I did notice about Microsoft, like as of late, is just kind of your, your overall business strategy on on you know software everywhere. You know, kind of a you want, you want to talk about kind of why those decisions. Well, I didn't want to take away from your answer because I was cururious how you were going to segue <laughs> with oh, your opinion of how the dev cycle or the just, li life cycle man. I was I going to segue? Well, <laughs> can we get any free credits in Azure? To, to <laughs> like, <laughs> we can work on that <laughs> for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there you go, students. students <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> this is when you hook them, by the way. Uh, you gotta get them. I'm you. I'm excited. I'm uh, taking notes. <laughs> uh, so, so what about that philosophy? You know, you got your you know software everywhere, um, support everything kind of philosophy. What what what's driving that that philosophy? Well, I think you know, even as you know, take your pick, um, collaborating together on software. Take you know, whether we're talking about open source, 30 plus years ago, what have you, .NET, just this evolution of our software in general. Um, there has been more and more willingness to open that to developers and of course understanding what your needs are uh, that can help the industry as a whole. Sure. Right? So a phrase that I just took away recently was, you know, we can collaborate on the code, but we can compete in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And right, so there's absolutely plenty of room for everybody to collaborate on these things and, and learn and, and you know, again, uh, create together. Uh, when it comes to, you know, choosing a partner and choosing technologies, that's where we start to say, well, you know, here are the strengths of what we provide or what we bring to the table that can work absolutely with the things that you're working with. Small shop, big shop, big partner, little partner. Um, and that, you know, that feels good to be able to say that. And, and again, I, I truly believe that. that. That's where we're moving as a company. I've been with Microsoft for 14 years. I wouldn't be there if I didn't believe fundamentally that we are there to collaborate and learn. Um, so this software as a service, infrastructure as a service, that's the direction we're going, you know, and we're changing. <laughs> that's, that, that change as a company is recent, as recent as Satya coming in. Sure. So a lot of change for us internally, but I think it's being reflected externally in these conversations about how, you know, hey, now there's Docker available, you know, being integrated with things like, you know, Windows Server, you know, and, and so, you know, that makes us excited. Yeah. Um, do you feel like, feel like technologies like Docker, uh, Help, help you facilitate that, allow you to focus maybe a little bit more on, on kind of a specific technology rather than trying to say, okay, I have to compete for the whole ecosystem. I can focus on, on, a, on a component. Sure, sure. I mean, I think, you know, many years ago, you would have heard us, you know, I probably would have stood up here and said, hey, Windows, <laughs> and, and hey, Office. Right. And, and that's, that's no longer, right? You know, Windows isn't everything we talk about. We pride ourselves on being a, a productivity and platform company. That's the new mantra from us. Mm -hmm. And so generally speaking, Productivity and platform means everything and all and working with all. And you know, you say, hey, you started on a Mac, you know, then you move to Linux, <laughs> and then you move to a virtual environment that could be you know, Azure or something like that. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, yes, we can do that, and yes, we support that, again, you know, pretty happy to be able to say that and share that. If, if, if you didn't know, that's where we are today. Thank you. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be on. contacted. <laughs> I'll, I can pick on Mike here for a second. So you've been in the, you, you have, a, a lifetime of experience, right? Of working in, in some of these these dev technologies. Um, do you care to comment on that and kind of how you're seeing the industry shift a little bit and, and you know, technologies like Docker fitting into that? Well, over the last decades or so, I mean, these things become more and more, there's layer upon layer. And so the actual hardware and the computing, things that does the computing for you is becoming more and more isolated from what you actually do to, to make the business work. I mean, 
these things are, you know, in the old days, you actually have to get a box and hire it up and, you know, install operating systems on it. Now it's literally a click of a button. Things that used to take days to do now are done in seconds, literally seconds. So that's, that's the big change now. With these Docker stuff, it seems like they're even abstracting out the, uh, the operating system at a whole. So all everything's just this little piece of code and it runs wherever you want. You don't even care where it runs. Mm -hmm. you just buy a big farm out there and just stick it out there wherever. So that's happening lots and lots and it's amazing to me that you know, things are, the way, how far things have gone in the last 20, 30 years. And, and I think, you know, back to, back to Lance's comments earlier, this is from a DevOps perspective, this is somewhat fantastic for you, right? Because you can, right. you can choose the best tool for the job yeah. rather than being stuck with what you have. Yeah, well, Absolutely. In, in the past, we're, we're using Chef, we're using whatever we pick that fits our, our workflow. Um, and, and we can still do that because of it's semi-standardized and they're working on it. They have the Open Container Initiative and the, the CNCF, I don't, it's a cloud networking one. But I'm able to use the different orchestration frameworks, they all work with Docker or whatever container system you're using, um, and it's supported through that entire workflow, which is, is the real advantage, because like, like you were saying earlier, you have that wall where, where the devs would throw their code over and the ops would go, it doesn't run or it doesn't perform or whatever the case is, and so breaking down that wall and getting it so that it's the same thing all the way through. It's, it's really powerful. Right. Half, half of your time spent in production environments is fixing stuff like that. New releases coming in, mm -hmm. doesn't work, or things that didn't get pick, fixed, or just tons and tons of stuff. The, the more you can put things together in one, one blob, so to speak, the better for deploying applications. Uh, Lance, you said earlier about, um, what, about 90%, I think you said, of, of the kind of the framing of a deployment goes on the dev now, and DevOps is about implementing that. Yeah. Uh, how exactly is that done, and, and specifically through Docker? Uh, in our case, we're putting, so like the configuration file for our services, the devs create that, they create a, uh, a configuration that works in locally and on the dev environment, and they're responsible for maintaining that and get along with the application. Uh, once we finish moving everything over to Docker, that'll include everything to support running it locally in Docker as well. Uh, the difference for us is as it goes through different environments, we just have overrides that take effect for, you know, it's, it's staging okay, it's different database servers or whatever the case is. Um, I'm lost. No, that's, that, that's, that's good. So, so. <laughs> The dev then puts it all together, hands it over, and then at what point does it actually cross over into DevOps, and where does DevOps take it? Um, I take it from when they, in my mind, I take it from when they commit it to Git. Okay. Uh, I push, if there's any problems, it's their app, their responsibility, they're the experts. So if there's any problems, I, I push back. Here's what's happening, here's, I need you to fix it, I will assist you in any way I can. Um, my responsibility is the servers and that process. Okay, um, so it, it, I hear, hear these words like staging. Uh, I think you know we, we, we see all these kind of evolutions in the software field, but we keep going back to you know what's commonly referred to as the IBM server model. You got you know your your, your staging, your dev, uh, sorry, dev, dev staging, release or, or test, and then you know finally production. Uh, how does does Docker is it antithesis to that? Does it fit into that model? You can use it that way. Um, you can do even more. You can, on demand, spin up entire environments. That's what you're doing on your laptop when you run Docker Compose up and you're running the entire stack. So it's how does your organization want to use it? If you want those four environments or eight or two, you can do that. Well, we've started that a lot. When I was at Disney, they had tons of environments, and they're always out of environments. You know, whenever a new app would come by or they want to fix something, they, oh, we got to use Dev 3 or Dev 7, and we don't have a new Dev app. So to that point is that that would have been really nice to be able to we have a, you know, a sudden fix needs to come up rather than having to kick everybody out of some giant environment we have full of database servers. We just have a little one that we could spin up on its own, hand it to them, and, uh, and fix it, and get back on, I'm back on the life. So that's a lot, that's, that's a lot. That's a big expensive thing in most, most in the organizations is trying to maintain dev and test environments. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that model is that they're very expensive to do that model. 
especially, especially with yeah, devs, yeah. Too, you, get, you, get the, you can have five, you can have one environment for every developer, Absolutely. essentially. Yeah, so. Sure, sure. And I was going to say, just touching on that, right, it's, that's a factor, right, is time, energy, and how much it's going to cost. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how much is it costing to spin up virtual databases? You know, <laughs> what's that consumption model right. that makes it so much easier today than obviously before? Versus hiring a DBA. Oh, oh my gosh, out. you know, and you know, energy efficient. I mean, there's all these things that factor into it. And again, it's a, these probably things that we don't really think about. Uh, obviously, you know, plenty of other things to think about. But if I'm an organization hiring a developer to develop these applications, you know, <laughs> I want to obviously do it at cost-effective way, right? But I, I want to provide an environment where those aren't, you know, because I can't spin up 10 databases or whatever, 100, that's not an inhibitor to you being able to develop as fast. You want them doing development work. You don't want them doing SA work. <laughs> there you go. It, Tony, you just brought up, uh, I heard, I'm going to steal it because I, I heard it. You said uh, energy efficiency. And that, that, that always strikes me, you know, it, it's one of those considerations that a lot of devs or DevOps don't, don't necessarily think about, you know, what the, the previous carbon footprint of cooling down massive servers and, and data centers and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So with Azure specifically, uh, and, and these kind of technologies, I mean, are you finding that your customers are, are like saving, not just, not just from the, the, the overhead of maintaining the servers, but then things like that, just simple. Sure, sure, guys, I mean, there's obviously, you know, only a couple of players in this space, right, that can offer these types of capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, hyperscaling at a, at a large scale, or hyperscaling in general. Um, we are absolutely committed to that kind of carbon footprint, right, and, and how that affects cost overall. Um, and you as a responsible, you know, global citizen, you know, making those decisions on which companies you want to choose uh, to bet on again, right, and, and, and invest in, uh, absolutely, that's, that's factored into everything that we do plenty of information around, you know, how we address, you know, cooling and energy efficiency. And I mean, it's built into, you know, our data centers, it's built in all the way down to the operating system. And so, you know, yes, we, we're proud to be able to share those types of things that again, some people may not just factor in, but if you are betting the farm on the technologies, you know, we, we want to keep those things in mind and then share those out with the, our customers, ultimately uh, your customers. Absolutely. As a, as a father, I appreciate anything that reduces <laughs> carbon footprint. Um, so uh, on the flip side of that, though, we, we did talk about, we, we've kind of touched upon it several times here, but, you know, abstracting away kind of the OS. I know Microsoft has been really focused with, you know, Hyper-V technology and, and those kind of things that allow people to kind of reduce the size of the kernel and the overhead of, of the actual operating system and, and get a little bit more specific in terms of what they need out of that operating system. You care to elaborate on, on that part of it? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd probably defer to someone that's experiencing it. You know, obviously we continue to make those investments. Uh, it's, it's at the core of what we, at least from our perspective, when we start talking about virtualization, making sure that, you know, we're keeping up with the times. And, and yes, you know, reducing the time that it takes to spin these things up, you know, how fast they can process. And so we're consistently revising the way that our technologies uh, address the changing needs of developers uh, across the board. But that's good. Um, how, how do I word this? How would you, trying to be biased here a little bit. <laughs> so uh, a lot of us kind of grew up in this Windows Server is too expensive I download MP3s for free world, right? And and we Linux kind of took advantage of that to to a large extent. You know, getting out there, the overhead, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for for a Microsoft server with you know SQL Server running on it. So, are you finding that this strategy is working in terms of getting customers to to take advantage? Because because it certainly has its advantages. You know, uh, I've worked on e-commerce platforms, SQL Server backends, that kind of stuff, which is fantastic. Active Directory, we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, are you finding that customers are now kind of coming back to using Microsoft for its strengths and, and what they love about Microsoft versus, you know. Sure, sure, but you know, it's been a, a little re-education as well. Um, you know, again, with this recent change in leadership with Satya there, uh, we've had to get back out. You know, people, we, we haven't had to talk about costs in a while. <laughs> it was almost a given, you know, and, and these technologies are absolutely, you know, were expensive at one point or another. Um, sharing that back with customers has been kind of eye-opening because obviously they've moved on to these other technologies that are deemed free and then, of course, you know, what value can we bring when you're getting something for free? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a true challenge. Uh, at the end of the day, though, hopefully, kind of this legacy that we've built uh, around security and trustworthy computing and all, again, a lot of buzzwords that mean a lot to many different people, but ultimately, those are strengths. Um, you marry those up with the weaknesses of some of these other things that, you know, again, designing or developing in a bubble, uh, you know, worried about firewalling applications, you know, and how you're going to secure that app, cybersecurity, all those, you know, again, all those things that you would worry about, we can bring to the table virtually free, you know, with some of these technologies we're talking about sure. that can then say, you know what, 
trust us. You know, we, we're working together, right? It's no longer about how much we're going to charge you <laughs> to use our technologies. It's about how can we collectively move together to improve these technologies, continue to reduce costs across the board, and ultimately, you know, provide the best product that we can build uh, with the skills and training and, you know, development things that you guys are creating. And that's kind of interesting is that, is that there's, there's an undertone here that, that I'm picking up from Docker to Microsoft that being able to be cross-platform, being able to be kind of agile, paying attention to future scalability, uh, deployability, maintainability, uh, all these things about being agile is kind of like the, the, the key word. So I, I'll go back to Hightail for a second Lance, and pick on you for a little bit. So for those of you who don't know, does anybody in here remember what uh, the company called You Send It? Uh, anybody ever sent a file through You Send It? See, no, no. See, you're all young. That's the thing. Uh, <laughs> back, back in my day, <laughs> five I, uh, years ago. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it used to be a really big challenge. So, actually, Hightail is, is a is a rebranded kind of reapproach to you. Send it, and just maybe you could share a little bit about kind of maybe uh, your take on on kind of how how you're growing with that same kind of you know mentality of like, okay, we have to offer services that people need. Yeah. So, you know, way back. You, it was difficult to send files through email. The email would bounce, servers, limits, whatever the case is. Um, Hightail started as you send it, and they offered a service where you uploaded the file to them, sent the link, off it goes, right? Great. Um, that's no longer special. That's, that's easy to do. You have multitudes of services that you can use or at least repurpose to do that. Um, we've moved on to you know, trying to be a, a leader in file sharing by offering things like uh, commenting. If, if you open up, if you put a file in uh, Spaces, it's our product, if you put a file in it, you get a screenshot of every single page in it, if it's multiple pages, whatever, and you can draw a box and comment. And you have a workflow for that comment and resolve this uh, very popular with a lot of our, uh, uh, like our content designer uh, customers, they want to share it with with their, uh, their their customers, so that they can provide feedback on whatever project. Uh, but it, it's things like that. We're moving into a more social file sharing and trying to become something that you don't have right now. So, do do you find as a whole that technologies like Docker help the company itself? be a little bit more agile in their vision and, and utilize their devs efficiently to kind of move with ever-changing kind of requirements? Uh, yes, and the reason it's, it's gonna be tainted from my perspective and managing all these different services. Um, our, our old stack was very, it's stuck in the mud. <laughs> um, it's running on very old OS's that we struggle keeping up to date and things like that, all, all for lots of different reasons, but it's because it's become so big with all the different functionalities um, and trying to keep it all working together and things like that. You, you don't change what's not broke on a lot of times, right? That's it. Um, so moving over to Docker, I am much less concerned with the OS and all the dependencies because during the development process I and, and the QA process and on through the life cycle, those are being updated with alongside the application. And I am not, it, it's very common for you to run your entire stack all on one version of an OS or something like that. That changes a little bit with Docker as well. I don't have to. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, we're currently running things on CentOS, we're currently running things on Ubuntu, mostly Ubuntu. Um, and we're actually playing around with Alpine Linux now, which is the new thing in Docker. Because um, it doesn't it doesn't matter anymore. It's just an application running on the Linux kernel. The OS is just there, and as little as possible to support that. Yeah, and that comes back to kind of uh, like we were talking about earlier with it, with Azure is that you could have application who has components that reside on a Linux kernel mm -hmm. and other components take advantage of uh, a Microsoft foundation. Uh, allow you know kind of applications to talk across. I, and then you guys just, uh, if I recall, you you announced at a DockerCon uh, the first kind of cross cross operating system application that that took advantage of that very thing. Yeah. And see, I, I would probably, <clears throat> I would assume that we'd make those things accessible as yeah. well, right? So part of the the partnership is in raising visibility and giving you that access. Um, you know, 
thousands of VMs and thousands of you know uh, ways to to leverage Linux already Linux that's already built. <laughs> you know, and they're just making them readily available for you to grab and pull down and then modify again. You know, with technologies like Docker. So, yes, again, really excited to to kind of showcase where you can find those things, uh, which we'll share obviously. Yeah. Anything else? No. All right. Uh, so at this time, we have a, uh, a few minutes left for, for q and I know we got a lot of people up here. we got a wealth of experience up here on the panel. Uh, you guys have questions for us this morning? You want to know a little bit more about anything specific? Looks like a couple hands up over there. Hi, I'm Lucas Cross. I'm in web dev. And I want to know if you guys have ever used Vagrant, because it kind of sounds the same as Docker. And I want to know the similarities Possibly this is for the whole board, if you guys have ever used it. I have. Um, so in moving over our application stack over to Docker, I actually put it in Vagrant first. Uh, because I was moving from deploying it on lots of different servers, and then I wanted it all to run on one. And so I used Vagrant as a stepping stone to, uh, to make all the changes I needed to do so that it could do that. Um, but as far as Vagrant goes, you have a Vagrant file, it's similar to a Docker file, but you're configuring full VMs in that case, um, along with networking and, and everything that to support that. Um, it's very similar in, in that way. Uh, I, I guess I would equate it more to like a Docker Compose file, but y again, you're, you're using those VMs, you're, you have all of those resources dedicated towards it. I, you, you know, my MacBook has 16 gigs of memory. I'm going to run maybe eight VMs total. And I have 19 services. The way they used to run, it was one service per box. That, that, that doesn't work. Um, so switching over to Docker, I no longer have that resource requirement. So that, that's my perspective, Vagrant versus Docker. How many Dockers have you run Docker images on a single 16 gig Mac? Um, so some of ours are really small, right. but others are, I like, I, I limit them a lot for when I'm running them on one machine. Uh, our current thing, I think we do about 120. 120, all right. yeah. so there you go. Uh, I think there's that. I think that one of the things that Docker offers as well, because of the containerization, because of the, the in, really industry buy-in, right? So you have companies like Microsoft, IBM, Amazon that are, that are really backing a technology. That's often make or break for some of these things. So even if you know Vagrant was able to, you know, further optimize to be able to allow you to get up to 120 on a single machine, which is just insane, uh, it, it doesn't currently have that. So you know, I think the trend is, is Docker, and Docker's just it, it might honestly come down to marketing. Sometimes you know, you get a company that, that gets that gets backed early, and then the, that that gives them certain advantages. Do we have another hand up over there? I think somewhere. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Uh, other question in the front here? Maybe. Someone hand up? Yeah, there you go. Uh, I would like to know uh, how how is virtualization different from uh, container services? Because uh, I was uh, I, I work with KVM. KVM is like uh, we can install a Windows system on uh, CentOS mm -hmm. something like that. And Docker, uh, it sounds similar, but then. Is it possible to install another operating system inside uh, a Docker container, or is it a uh, totally hardware uh, site? I, I think you should think about Docker like Tetris. That's how I like to define it. Like, you know, you get a block that comes down, and then another block has to sit on top of that block, and then another block, and so forth. And so containerization is more about that. It's about, you know, you have that base layer, which is an operating system, or, or even just specific components of an operating system, a specific piece of the kernel, and then uh, it's dependency based. So everything that you stack on top of that gets gets tied back into that that bottom container versus virtualization, which is actually an entire virtualized environment. Yeah. Whole machine. Yeah. Extend on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, in virtualization, like you said, it's the entire OS, the entire hardware stack, everything. So a Linux machine, you're talking, I don't know, three gigs of hard disk space and at least 512 megs of memory to support just running the machine. Just to boot it. Um, the Docker image that I'm using is seven megs and uses 12 megs of memory. So that, but that's how I'm able to achieve that scale. Is that, I'll answer that a little bit. Okay, uh, <coughs> other questions here? We got, try to make sure I'm not missing any hands. No, we got one in the back. 
Hello, my name is Jeff. I'm actually in game dev. Um, mobile development is really interesting from a game perspective. How useful do you think a service like Docker is in implementing like testing for games, compatibility, other things like that? Uh, I'm assuming that was towards me. Um, the uh, every every program in here. I mean, I'm assuming all of you guys are interested in, in tech and app deployment, what, regardless of what platform, right? Uh, or supporting, in, as far as the dev app side, right? Uh, in game dev, you guys aren't going to be doing a ton of, of, of deployment, but if you think about any game that's out there, um, the, just the trend is they have either a companion app or all the way down to like a complete like kind of online mini version of something that you have to do while you're at work and you go home and enjoy the benefits of that at the game. So uh, leaderboards, all these kind of technologies that, that utilize some kind of central shared kind of repository of data, they need that web presence, right? So you're going to have a cloud person working on it. You're going to have a web person uh, administering it. You're going to have DevOps people deploying it. Uh, not to mention that there's also going to be all the enterprise elements that, that go into game dev where you, know, you have your team collaboration when you're actually de developing the game, not even just the building for the players playing it. And Docker is going to allow you to kind of have that uh, at a reduced cost with with infinite scalability, especially if you're an indie game developer. You don't have a ton of money to kind of sit out there and develop this giant web server that's going to hold 300,000 users the first day. You know, you might you might start off with 10 and then 100, and then maybe you get featured in the App Store. Now all of a sudden you have 300,000 downloads. Docker is one of those things where you can go, okay, and like we said earlier, you know, okay, there's this one aspect, maybe maybe the database for for scoring or for matchmaking or something like that, that is getting hammered. So we can just scale that out and multiply that container, and, and have that container support that on-demand load, um, and then you can kind of adjust that over time. So anything, any any technology, games, mobile, just an app, uh, any kind of enterprise software, you're going to need that kind of ability to scale that out, and Docker really helps facilitate that to where you're not incurring unnecessary costs to, to scale everything up when you might only need a couple components. And you can start a Docker container in like five milliseconds versus like yeah. a minute for starting up a VM, so maybe two minutes. Yeah. So it's, it's a mean, big thing. Yeah, it's really about cost overhead, helping helping any guys get out get out there a little bit faster, and and, and, and it goes back to that uh, what we were talking about with Tony as well. Um, it's a lot of overhead ten years ago to get set up with a Windows environment. So if you wanted to take advantage of SQL Server or Active Directory or you know kind of you know a, a native Windows um, you know GPO controlled environment, um, nowadays you can you can f you can start spending up just the components that you need that Microsoft provides. Uh, at a less overhead and less barrier of entry and take advantage of, of you know, kind of this ongoing theme of, of use the best tool for the job, not, not be locked into something because it might be cost prohibitive or something like that. Yeah, it's a good question. Do you have any other questions going on in here? It's pretty good, it's pretty good. All right, well then at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for joining our session. Uh, thank you for my uh, panelists. You had wealth of information and your time. Uh, we appreciate you coming out. Oh, do we have another question? Oh, we have questions online in the back. Can't see. Sorry. Never, never mind. No, you're not. You're not thanked yet. Stay We've here. been watching for, and it just popped in. Okay. A uh, question from one of our students named Joe. How would you identify whether a problem resides within a base image or an added container by a dev member? Oh, there you go. Identify a problem. I guess it depends on the problem. Um, You can run, so one of the things with Docker is every single line in a Docker file or however you've managed to put your thing together is a separate layer. So you can run, you know, I, I have my application. I can run a command prompt inside three layers down from there and do whatever I need to do to debug and see if it exists there or something like that. So I think that is something that can help there. Gives you extra or extra places to look, so to speak. Or, you know, yes, and points. they build the images build pretty quickly. So if you suspect something, you can change it, take it know, out, put rebuild it, it, run it again, see if that problem exists. I think with Docker specifically, too, the base image is relatively consistent, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you're not. That's one of the advantages is you're not having to worry about actually that base layer having some of the. The, the libraries or services installed onto it 
randomly from a container because the container is contained. That's that's kind of the idea. So if if the problem is is a base layer problem, you kind of I think you said it yourself. You know, you kind of just know it's like all right, well this dependency wasn't met. Why was that allowed? You know, kind of a thing versus versus something with the code at a runtime. Use a different base layer. Right? <laughs> And the other thing I guess to add is is you used, hopefully you used that same image through dev all the way to production. So if that problem existed, you found it before it made it to production. Good. Okay. Good. Are we are we good on questions now? I don't. I don't want to thank them three times. <laughs> okay, so once again, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, wonderful panel. Thank you for my panelists. A whole bunch of information. Uh, and thank you for attending Full Sail Hall of Fame. Thanks.